Guys, Cryptic has announced two new ships coming to Star Trek Online, and they are interesting. Normally, I wait for the blog for these sort of videos, but I am wide awake and have nothing better to do, so let's talk about the new ships. The first ship they announced is the new Emerald Chain Intel Juggernaut, which is coming to an upcoming lockbox. The other new ship they announced is the Jerok Alliance Carrier, which will be this year's anniversary event ship. I'll start with the Jerok Alliance Carrier first, because I'm pretty sure more of you care about that one than the Emerald Chain ship. You know, because it's the free one. Being an Alliance ship, the ship is the combination of two different design styles from two different factions within the Alliance. In the Jerox case, it's a combination of Romulan and Federation design, which is pretty obvious because it has the saucer section but also has that big Dideradex style hull, which, saying it out loud, you would think that wouldn't work so well, but, I mean, look at it, it's gorgeous. Once again, Stowe's ship art team just absolutely knocks it out of the park. Now, the Jerox is a full science carrier, which I have some mixed feelings about. Carriers are pretty underpowered in comparison to normal science ships, and that's because they don't have a secondary deflector. If you're gonna have all that science seating, you really need a secondary deflector to get the most out of it. I imagine the thinking is that the two hangar bays are supposed to make up for the damage that you're not getting from a secondary deflector. The problem is that hangar pets have never been that powerful. I don't care which pets you use, they're never going to make up for the power that a secondary deflector can put out. Sorry, this is turning into a rant about carriers, and that's not what I wanted this video to be, because as far as carriers go, this one actually seems to be a pretty good one. It has a 3-3 weapons layout, which is pretty standard for carriers, 4 device slots, 4 engineering consoles, 4 science consoles, and 3 tactical consoles, and 2 hangar bays because it's a carrier. I should also point out that this ship does use a warp core. Because of a teaser that Cryptic put out on their official Twitter account, there were rumors that this ship might have a singularity core. It doesn't, it has a warp core, and trust me, that's a good thing. Apparently this ship is also supposed to have a turn rate of about 8 degrees per second, which is actually pretty impressive for a carrier. The ship is going to be surprisingly maneuverable for one of its size. Now, the first thing that makes this ship really interesting is its bridge officer layout. It has a Lieutenant Commander Universal Temporal Seat, a Lieutenant Tactical Seat, a Lieutenant Commander Engineering Seat, a Commander Science Seat, and an Ensign Science and Command Seat. That Temporal Seat is what makes this interesting, because Temporal pairs really well with Science builds. So while you won't be able to get any crazy high-end builds on this thing, you should be able to pull off an adequate Science build on this ship. Now, there are two other reasons why you're going to want to make sure you get this ship while the event's on. The first is that the Jurok comes with new unique hangar pets, Alliance Fighter Squadrons. They're armed with anti-proton beam arrays and pulse cannons, but can also use the ability Focused Assault. What Focused Assault does is it marks an enemy target, and any allies that fire on that target get a bonus damage and bonus accuracy buff. Now, during this announcement, Cryptic said they are also reworking how Focused Assault works. Because you'll have multiple units using this ability at the same time, Focused Assault will now be able to stack which means you'll have the potential to get some really nice bonus damage buffs with these fighters. You'll be able to use these fighters on any ship with a hangar bay, so if you like using ships with hangar bays, you're probably going to want these fighters. The other big reason to want this ship is for its console, Sensor Suppression Burst. It gives passive buffs to Critical Chance and Auxiliary Power, which is actually pretty nice. I've said before, you can never have enough crit chance, and Auxiliary Power is going to be useful on a science-heavy ship like this. But the click ability is what's impressive about this console. The click actually has two different effects. First, it'll give a 20% buff to Critical Chance for 5 seconds, and reset the recharge time of all hangar bays for yourself and all allies within 20 kilometers. This will actually be applied to the whole team, not just yourself. But it'll also give plus 30% crit chance to all player hangar pets and summons within 20 kilometers for 20 seconds, and placate any enemies within 10 kilometers. This is going to be a powerful console. 5 seconds is not a long time, but 20% is a big crit chance buff. If you can equip enough triggers for unconventional systems, you're going to get a good amount of use out of this console, which means a lot of crit chance. Furthermore, that second crit chance buff that affects your hangar pets and summons is kind of insane. Augie pointed this out to me, and I'm really glad he did, but the Bowel Sentries from the Sentry Mode console count as summons. And as some of you may know, that is one of my favorite consoles. So with this console, I'm going to be able to further buff Sentry Mode, which means I'm going to have to work this console into my Bowel Turret build. This will be really powerful for hangar pets, too especially if you have the Starship trait Superior Area Denial. Combine those two together and you're going to get a lot of power out of your hangar pets. So if you like carrier builds, you are going to want this console. And even if you're not that big on carrier builds, you're probably still going to want this console. And lastly, the ship's Starship trait is called Backup Shield Batteries. Yep, it's a shield trait. Anytime you activate a Drain Bridge Officer ability, you gain a charge. You can stack up to four of these. When one of your shield facings is depleted, this trait will automatically consume one of those charges and restore that shield facing. Honestly, as far as shield traits go, this is probably going to be one of the better ones. Problem is, shields still function the same way. They're still going to be built like tissue paper, so you're going to burn through those charges real quick, because you can only earn one every 15 seconds. Furthermore, it's also important to note that Tachyon Beam drains all four shield facings at the same time, 
so this is still going to be totally useless against the Borg. So yeah, Starship trade aside, I really like this ship. Yes, it's a carrier, so it's not going to be great for DPS, but with the right build, you can still get this through any content in the game, no problem. And you're going to look good doing it, because this is a gorgeous ship, so it's worth picking up just for the space barbie of it all. Furthermore, the ship comes with a console and fighter pets that are probably going to be meta, or at the very least, they're going to be powerful enough that you're going to want them unlocked on your whole account. But ultimately, the best part about this ship is that it's free. It will cost you no money whatsoever. All you gotta do is keep up with your event daily. Now, for the other ship that was announced tonight, the Emerald Chain Intel Juggernaut. I've seen several people asking what the heck is this ship. This ship is modeled after the Viridian from Season 3 of Star Trek Discovery, which means it's another 32nd century ship. The Viridian was commanded by Osira, who was the leader of the Emerald Chain, and was the main antagonist for Season 3. So being an Emerald Chain ship, this is technically a 32nd century Orion ship. I'm sure plenty of you are ready to hate on the look of this ship, but it's canon, get over it. The ship is going to be released in an upcoming Emerald Chain themed lockbox, along with several other items, which we won't know about until the announcement blog. But what we can look at are the ship's stats, which were shown off on 10 Forward Weekly. Like it says in the name, this is an Intel Juggernaut, meaning it's a full Intel ship that's going to be very large and very tactical heavy. And I do mean large. See that picture over there? That's this ship sitting next to the Enterprise J. This is going to be a very big ship. Now, for its actual stats. It has a 4-4 weapons layout, 3 device slots, 2 engineering consoles, 4 science, and 5 tactical consoles. Because it's a juggernaut, it's going to have a very low turn rate. I'm pretty sure they said its turn rate was 5 degrees per second, which is actually like the lowest turn rates get in this game. But considering the size of the ship, that kind of makes sense. For its bridge officer seating, it has a Lieutenant Commander Universal Command seat, a Commander Tactical Intel seat, a Lieutenant Tactical seat, an Ensign Engineering seat, and a Lieutenant Commander Science seat. That Lieutenant Commander Command seat means you're going to be able to pull off a fantastic torpedo build on the ship. But with that Intel seat, you could also do a really nice energy weapon build. The ship also has a special inherent ability, I forget the name of it because they didn't show us the tooltip, but it's like the Vodward Juggernaut's Polaron Barrage. But instead of repelling enemies and dealing Polaron damage, this one deals plasma damage and will hold enemies, and that hold actually makes this one a little bit better. This ship's console is called Programmable Matter Projectors. Its passives give a 20% buff to cannon damage, and plus 24.2 to EPG, which really isn't a lot. What it does is fire off a 90 degree cone of physical damage. Anything caught within that cone will receive some physical damage, followed by some physical damage over time, a small reduction to energy weapon damage resistance, and will have their engines disabled for 15 seconds. I'm not overly impressed with this console. All the physical damage means it could be decent for an EPG build, but that also means you're not going to get anything out of that cannon damage buff, because most EPG builds are using torpedoes. I don't know, it's not bad. You could probably get some decent use out of it on a very specialized build, like a Deucide build that uses cannons, but ultimately this feels like one of those consoles that's more interested in fitting the theme for the show rather than fitting into the meta. It is what it is. Now, if you thought the console was odd, wait till you see the trait. Lash of the Chain, which periodically negates the shared cooldown of cannon firing modes. Now, for the life of me, I cannot figure out what the point of this trait is. To eliminate the shared cooldown of your firing modes means you're running more than one firing mode on your build, which is generally considered a bad idea because of that shared cooldown. Typically, what we do is rely on one firing mode and extend its duration as long as possible. So this trait is kind of useless if you have Withering Barrage, which is a really easy trait to have. And even if you're not using one of those extension traits, this is still not a very good Starship trait, because it has a 45 second recharge. So it's not like you're going to be able to constantly flip-flop between two different firing modes, which honestly, I don't know why you'd want to in the first place. So yeah, the trait and the console are pretty meh. But the ship, however, I'm actually really into the ship. It is comically large, which is something I've always liked in a ship. It's well suited for both energy weapon and torpedo builds. It's a 32nd century ship, so it's going to have a 32nd century cloak. But there is one other thing that this thing has. Animated turret mounts. Sadly, I don't have a way to show this on this video, but the ship has several weapons mounts spread across its hull, which are shaped like very large directional cannons. And Cryptic figured out how to make them move, so the cannons will actually follow their target when firing. I'll link the VOD to the livestream down below just so you guys can see it for yourselves. It's such a simple thing that was probably very not simple to implement, and I find it very amusing. Because this ship has a 4-4 weapons layout, and the weapon mounts actually move, and it's so big that it turns like a house, I really want to put a turret build on this ship. But it is a lockbox ship, so it's not going to be easy or cheap to get. So I won't make any promises, but I'm really hoping I'll be able to turn this ship into Lazy Boat 3.0. I don't know if you guys want to see that or not, but I definitely want to do it. Now, before I wrap up, there is one more thing I want to talk about. 
Along with this ship, we also got a peek at the new weapons this ship comes with, which are just basic versions of the weapons that will be in the new lockbox. These are called Viridian Plasma Weapons, and I want to talk about them because they have a very interesting proc on them, which is a 2.5% chance to give a plus 30% firing cycle haste buff to all Viridian Plasma Weapons for 6 seconds. This sounds really good, and I am very eager to try out these weapons. Firing Cycle Haste is a very important thing to buff on Beam Overload builds. All weapons-based builds, really, but especially Beam Overload. So if you like Plasma builds or Beam Overload builds, I would definitely recommend picking up a set of these. Yeah, those are the new ships coming to Star Trek Online. Like I said, I am really hyped for these ships, and I cannot wait to get my hands on them. Let me know what you guys think of the new ships down below. Also, be sure to like and subscribe while you're down there. My name's Stu, and I will see you guys next time.